G'day, it's Paul from Polyman Astro. Now I'm sure a lot of you came to my channel via my Pixie Insight for Beginners series. And judging by the comments, I'm hoping that that series has helped a lot of you along your journey. Now for me, it was thinking about masks and how to apply masks to my images that made me realize I was moving beyond the basics. And that's what this video is all about, applying masks and using masks in Pixie Insight. So stick around, and if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. I'm always interested in comments and I try to get back to people as quick as I can. And of course, if you like the content, please consider subscribing, it does help the channel. Now, a mask is a binary image that's used to selectively protect or exclude certain areas of the image from processing. They're usually represented as a black and white image where the black pixels are protected and the white pixels are where we can apply processing. The use of masks within PixInsight is a powerful tool for selectively controlling your image processing. They are widely used in tasks such as noise reduction, sharpening, and I use them all the time to selectively control my color and contrast adjustments. To apply a mask, simply drag it under the target image's name, as you see shown here. You'll know you've successfully done that when the target image's name turns a reddy brown color. Alternatively, with your target image selected, go to the mask, select mask menu, and choose your appropriate mask from the drop-down menu. It's important to note that any previews that you've added or that you add at a later stage while the mask is applied will also have the mask applied to them. Equally as important, it should be noted that masks need to be non-linear, i.e. they need to be stretched. This is true even if you're working with linear data. The mask itself needs to be stretched. Now, when you first apply a mask to an image, you'll probably see that the image turns largely red. This is PixInsight's visual representation of the mask. And it's handy to remember the phrase, red hides, white applies. That way you know where the mask is protecting your image and where it's allowing you to process the image. Of course, this isn't very useful in practice. Uh, it, it would make sense to be able to hide the mask so that it's still there, it's still applied, it's just you don't see it, it doesn't get in the way. And you can do that by using this little show hide icon at the top here. If you click it, it hides it and then shows it over and over again when you keep clicking it. Alternatively, you can use the keyboard shortcut Control K to achieve the same thing. Now, sometimes we don't want to actually apply the mask as we created it. We want to apply its polar opposite, otherwise known as its inverse. This is often used for something like noise reduction, where it's actually the background that we want to apply the noise reduction to the most, and very little of it to the actual high signal areas. Now, you can invert a mask when you first apply it by ticking the invert mask option. You can also invert the mask at a later stage by going up to the mask menu and choosing invert mask, or you can use the keyboard shortcut Control shift i Now the easiest mask to create and apply is a luminance mask. For a color image, you can just click on this icon up here, which says extract CIE star L component. That's just a really fancy way of saying it wants to extract the luminance component from your image, just the brightness information from your image. If you're working on a monochrome image, then you need to choose the target image, go up to the image menu and choose duplicate. This will make an identical copy of the image you're working on and you'll be able to use that as a luminance mask. Now, as already stated, for a luminance mask or any mask to be effective, it needs to be non-linear. So if you're working at the linear stage at the moment and you've extracted the luminance or you've made a duplicate of the monochrome image, you will now need to stretch that image to be useful as a mask. And most of the time, it's fine to just use the default STF and apply that permanently to the image via the histogram transformation tool. Now, luminance masks are useful when you try to protect or work on sections of an image based on its brightness values. And as I've said, this is particularly useful when doing noise reduction and sharpening. For noise reduction, you'll generally want to work on the inverse of the mask, applying most noise reduction to the signal weak areas, i.e. the background. Another extremely useful tool for mask creation is the range selection tool. And this is my personal go-to for creating masks. And in its default settings, if you look at the live preview, it'll just show white. And that's because at the moment, the sliders are set to select everything from pure black to pure white, and therefore you just get a white image. By adjusting the lower limit and upper limit sliders, you can control where the black and white point are, 
and therefore select the appropriate luminance range for the mask you'd like to create. You'll notice that the mask is extremely binary. It's just black or it's white, and the transition from black to white is extremely harsh. You can control this harshness via the fuzziness and smoothness sliders. Now you'll notice that the mask is largely devoid of structure, unlike a luminance mask. And for some selective processing, this can be extremely useful. However, the tool does have a screening option, and in fact in its default state, it produces a luminance mask. The advantage of the range selection tool in this context is that you can further refine it using the lower and upper limit sliders. And of course, you can introduce some fuzziness and smoothness to make the transitions a little less harsh. Another extremely useful mask creation tool is the game script. It was created by Herbert Walter and it's part of his HVB repository, which can be found at skypixels.at. A game doesn't stand for game as in playing a game, it stands for Galaxy Mask Editor. And that gives you a hint what it's mostly used for. People use it for quickly and efficiently creating elliptical masks to cover their galaxies. But that's not the only thing it could be used for. It's quite an effective tool for working on halos for filters as well. Now you can quickly and easily add the game script as well as a lot of the other useful scripts in the HVB repository by going to Updates, Manage Repositories and then adding the repository, which is in the description below. Now let's have a little bit of a play with some masks so you can see how it works in practice. This is Gabriella Mistril, which is part of the Eta Carina Nebula. And you can see here I have a luminance image and a 4x image. I also have a stock standard SHO image in the so-called Hubble palette. Finally, there are two star layer images here, one for the luminance and one for the color image and we'll add them back right at the end. Now I'm gonna use the range selection tool to create a series of masks. And my idea here is to turn the 4X image, which already looks quite good. It was created using my 4X palette utility tool. We're gonna to selectively apply the SHO image just to make certain regions pop a little bit more. That nebula on the right is where we're gonna first work on. And you can see here that I'm creating a range mask and then Alongside, I'm using the clone stamp tool. So it's a little bit of cheating, but I'm gonna eliminate all the other nebulosity. So I just have that nebula on the right. And then I'm gonna do a little bit of pixel math where I'm going to take 67% of the 4X image and 33% of the SHO image and apply iteratively until I like what I see. And hopefully you'll agree that makes that nebula on the right pop just that little bit more. And now what we're gonna do is the same kind of thing again. But this time, if you have a look on the left there, there's a little bit of nebulosity, I think kind of looks like a flame. It's already got a bit of subtle orange to it. We just want to make that pop a little bit more and give it more of a sense that it really is a bit of flame. It should produce a nice little bit of contrast there. So again, we'll use the range selection tool, zero in on just that bit of flame, and then use the clone stamp tool to eliminate everything else. And then again, I'll use that pixel math iteratively until I like what I see. Then we're gonna do the same idea to the luminance layer. I'm gonna create a range mask on just the bright regions of nebulosity and apply LHE at a few different layer levels. And I tend to work at a level of about 20 and then 80. Now I like to apply LHE at the full amount initially because I find that preview doesn't give the full story. And then I reduce that amount to something more appropriate, essentially by trial and error. And then finally we'll produce one more mask where I just want to concentrate on the very brightest regions. And here I'm going to apply MLT sharpening. So to do sharpening, you, ma you make sure that the noise reduction layers are turned off and you use the bias. Now I tend to find layer two, a bias of about 0.1 and layer three, a bias somewhere between about 0.05 and 0.1 works quite nicely for me. Now that's all done. We can make sure the masks are no longer applied to either image. We can put the stars back and then create an LRGB image as you can see here. All right, so that's it for this video. If you've stuck around this long, thanks for watching. Hopefully you've learned a lot about using and applying masks in PixInsight and it's gonna move you beyond the basics. Again, if you did like the video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. It really helps the channel. Thanks for watching.